Welcome to Meet the Candidates. The Frankfurt Plant Board has been willing to work with us so we can bring candidates in here, talk with them about the issues, about themselves, get to know them a little better as people and as candidates. And I want to alert you to watch for information about the Candidates Forum on April 26th down at the hotel. Participate if you possibly can. Send questions in if you have them. And then, by all means, schedule time to watch our live coverage of the primary election results on May 22nd. We'll be down at the county clerk's office and bring you those numbers just as soon as they're available. And in order for us to be able to have numbers to report to you, we're going to meet the candidates. And on this edition, we're going to talk with Tracy Hopper, who's running for jailer of this county. And I am so glad that you could come in here this afternoon and talk with us a little bit. So tell us what you think are some of the issues here that you're going to need to face. <clears throat> thank you. I, I would first like to say thank you guys for having me today. Um, <clears throat> some of the issues, the biggest issue, and I think not just locally or through the state, nationwide, is the drug, the drug issues that we're having, the drugs that are coming into the jail. What are we going to do to stop and prevent this from happening? I understand they have a body scanner up there. We still have officers that work up there. They should still be getting a search. Um, when they come through the body scanner, I don't know why that, that didn't pick up this last bit of methamphetamine that um, was giving to over 20 female inmates, you know, were reported to be high on methamphetamines. And this has just been in the last month since we've had the scanner. And I understand the scanner was used. Um, and I understand it's been successful, you know, a, a few times, a couple times that I've heard of. But that's the biggest thing. Um, let's not pretend that the jail is not the biggest liability in Franklin County. If I told, if I said anything different, if anybody ever says anything different, they, they don't know the facts. You know, no one seems to care about what goes on at the Franklin County Jail until we get in trouble. And this drug epidemic is, you know, wreaking havoc on every, on everybody. Um, county jails are filling it. We here in, in Franklin County are filling it. Um, well, Tracy, what what protocols can we set in place that would at least make an attempt to counteract that? Um, we have to be very careful when we say that we're going to do a hygiene search opposed to a strip search. There's the language that you use. You have to be very careful. Um, when people come in and they're, they're brought in on drug charges or they have passed drug charges, you know, that allows us to do a different type of search. Those are red flags there. Um, and if someone has been known to bring contraband into the facility, you're with well within your rights to put them in a dry cell area. And what that means is you just turn the water off and, you know, they, when they, you know, you'll come through and flush for them um, after they use the bathroom. But we want to make sure that, you know, for the first 24, 48 hours that they're in there. If they have something on them, you know, we found it. You know, with the body scanner, after they've stayed 24 hours, scan them again. Scan them again and see. Um, I, I think that there was an issue where, where the drugs were located at is why they didn't pick it up on the body scanner. Well, see, those are things that a lot of us out in the community right. don't realize. Right. Uh, that there are different procedures there, that show up at different right, and, and different there are di there are different procedures. When someone comes in the back door, you know they're um, they're patted down. Everything's removed from their pockets. They do a check, make sure they don't have anything. I think with all of the drug. Um, the contraband issues we have now, what we're going to have to do as soon as they hit that back door, you come through the scanner. There can be nothing any more important than checking this out as soon as they come in. We need to make sure that they're going through the body scanner, they're having a search done if they have the prior record, and we should know those things. Um, being in a correctional officer is a very, very hard job and you have so many things going on at one time. My plan 
and, and it's on my website, my solution to uh, a little more attention to detail is having booking clerks. These clerks will handle all of the administrative duties. The sworn peace officers in the jail, these are officers that will work directly with the inmates. We're gonna take the administrative frustrating work away from the officers and then they can focus on the attention to detail, zeroing in on these drugs and any other type of contraband that they're bringing into the facility. Which leads us to another major issue that we're forced, forced to face most of the time and that is what about the budget? What's going to happen with that budget? How does it stand right now? What do you anticipate with the projected budget cuts, that sort of thing. How do we deal with that budget issue? Um, the setting administration has said that they have uh, saved hundreds of thousands of dollars. I have asked for open records and starting back in October. I asked for some, you know, I'll ask for open records on certain things. Um, and that's as clear as mud, the open records that I've received. So I've had to call somebody else in and, you know, go over these records with me. But we can hide and say, we're turning this money back in. And, but you're asking for more money. You're padding this. So, you know, we, we have the scanner that they've paid for. We've recently paid 80 some thousand dollars for an emergency out there for the boiler system. Um, in the last three years, the Franklin County Regional Jail has purchased over $120,000 in vehicles, which now brings their fleet to 13 vehicles. Why we need 13 vehicles out the jail, Franklin County will have to ask the setting jailer that question theirself. Um, these vehicles are being driven home by the jailer. They're being driven home other vehicles from that fleet are being driven to Berea by one of the uh, uh, supervisors. Another one's being driven home to Woodford County. So not only are they making a large salary, they're getting the fringe benefits of a vehicle, gas being paid, insurance is being paid on these vehicles, maintenance are being kept up. You know. We're not, those days will be over. If Franklin County elects me in there, I will be a good steward of their money. I will, we won't be driving vehicles home. We won't be spending that kind of money. That's just not gonna happen. Um, you know, last year the women's shelter needed, they, I've seen a post on Facebook, they needed a vehicle and needed repairs or a vehicle. We have 13 out at the jail. Why didn't we give one of those older vehicles to them? You know, <clears throat> then we didn't. We, we didn't offer that up. But again, I, I'm, I'm going to post all of my open records <clears throat> that I have received from fiscal court. I'm gonna post them on a link. They're, they're open records, they're open to the public. I can scan them and do whatever I want to with them. And I'm gonna post them on my website. I want Franklin County to see what their money's being spent on out there. And <clears throat> again, Nobody knows what goes on at the jail. If we had it to do, we'd put a big dark curtain around the jail out there and say, don't nobody ask any questions about it. And Franklin County has not been aware in a long time. In 2014, my opponent promised that um, he would be a good steward of our money. <clears throat> and I just, don't be I just don't believe that he has been. He said that he was gonna grow that garden out there and he was gonna save Seventy to ninety thousand dollars in that garden. That kind of money has not been made in that garden out there. And if it had, you spent one hundred twenty thousand dollars on vehicles that we didn't need. And he said we're going to go back after the Anderson County contract. He said it's a one point eight million dollar contract we missed out on, when in fact it's a six hundred thousand dollar contract, and it was a bigger liability than what Franklin County needed. And now we're out there warehousing inmates for revenues. Well, why are we why are we warehousing these inmates? What are we doing with the money? Are we buying vehicles? We don't run a county patrol out there. That's not what we're doing. We don't need patrol vehicles. We don't need vehicles for people to use for their personal use. You know, the officers that are working out there, no one hands them 
a vehicle to drive back and forth, and they're not making, you know, near $30 an hour. And they're, they're not getting the benefits of that. You know, we have drugs coming in there. Mr. Rogers was a detective. <clears throat> Kelly Rouse, I think, was, uh, he's a retired police officer. Um, Mr. Wyatt, I'm not sure what his title is. I seen in court one day he called himself an investigator. The newspaper calls him um, a uh, spokesperson for the jail. We never had, we didn't have jobs like that out there. We just didn't have them. We had correctional officers out there mm -hmm. and we had sergeants and lieutenants out there and we had a captain. Um, which, which leads me to one question that did come to my attention from the community. I, I'm sure you hear far more than I do. But one of the questions that, that I heard was a chief deputy is supposed to uh, have certain responsibilities that aren't always the, what the public should, would think they should be. If you were jailer, what duties would you assign to a chief deputy and why? The chief, de I, don't, I don't know that I wouldn't have a chief deputy. So, I mean, I, there's no assignment for me. Um, I, I don't feel like that that's a needed job. We don't need a chief deputy out there. We need a captain, um, someone that's going to work by my side. And then, you know, if I'm, if I'm, meet with staff and we have staffing issues, we're going to work together and get people hired in. You know, training is a huge issue. That, you know, that was another thing that uh, my opponent in 2014 said, training is a huge issue. He kept the same training officer. He didn't, he didn't replace him. That training officer was the one that let Mr. Bowling walk out that back door. They missed seven opportunities to identify that man and they didn't. So, there, it was an honest mistake, is what Mr. Rogers said to uh, the State Journal, and I and I give him that. But what Franklin County needs to be concerned about was why did it take the State Journal asking him almost a week later, and then him waiting another 24 hours to respond in an email. <coughs> Excuse me, and he said he had a four-hour jump on us. Policy and procedures say uh, the instant you find out that you have a breach in security, an escaped inmate, facility goes into lockdown, the authorities are notified, the media is notified because it's hard to get to all of these businesses around the jail. It's hard to get to these um, uh, residents around there. You know, we have KECU Bank. You know, what if you or I would have been pulling up to the ATM machine? Mr. Bowling, when he was brought in, was not brought in easily. He resisted arrest and was charged with that. You know, and he, Mr. Uh, Rogers said that, you know, there was a ruse by the jail. The inmate, you know, he, he, he duped the jail. He did. And he got out the back door. He got out with his armband on his arm. Nobody checked his armband at the tower. The process of releasing somebody is booking will call up, call to the back of the tower, and they'll say, bring somebody up, bring so-and-so up, bed and baggage. They'll call in the, to the pod and they'll say, send in mo inmate bowling. Well, Brown is who was supposed to have been released. Send inmate Brown up. Mr. Bowling came up instead. Brown was, you know, alleged to have been asleep. Bowling came up to the booking area and signed paperwork. They didn't check his armband, um, didn't check the signature, didn't ask him who he was. The training officer that um, is the trainer of every new employee that comes in, he's the one that let him out the back door. A supervisor started the release pro the process the training officer completed the release process. And then another training officer that I seen on the news was the one that opened the door and walked him out. And he still had his armband on. His picture is on his armband. What protocols would you set? What changes <clears throat> would you make either in changing personnel 
or in changing the way they function. What changes would you make to ensure that this does right. not happen again? The booking clerks, they would be charged with the booking, the intake and release. And this is all they're doing. They're not doing observations. They're not on the radio with anybody. This is a very attention to detail. Are the jail functions with the courthouse um, and anybody doing business with the jail? And you have to pay attention. We have to get the right people to court. You know, I've said in, you know, prior to um, being at Bondert Middle School now um, in eighth grade, I have um, worked in pretrial services. So I've had a front row seat since day one when Mr. Rogers took office. And <clears throat> left the jail, left pretrial services where I would be in the jail, go in 6.30 in the morning. You know, I was there 6.30 in the morning the day the lady had her baby. That's another story. Um, but booking clerks will, will cut down on that. Officers are, have a tough job. You can be booking somebody in or releasing somebody. A fight breaks out. You have 15 state inmates waiting to be processed in. <clears throat> but I've said this time and time again because I've worked at the jail for years. <clears throat> and whoever is ready to go out, if it's release, these people being booked in, we're, we're okay. Get these people out the back door. And every time somebody walks out the back door, your liability goes down. So every time we're bringing these people in and warehousing and stacking them in the jail so we can uh, make a profit, well, you know, there's no such thing as a profit in a jail. Everything comes back to budget <clears throat> issues. Do you anticipate having to make significant changes in order to accomplish what you want to accomplish as jailer? <clears throat> I, I don't know that I'll make significant changes. Um, <clears throat> we won't be purchasing any vehicles for a while. We're, we're, we're pretty caught up there. Some maintenance needs to be done around the jail. Um, we need some more inmate programs, and that would be another 30 minutes for me to sit here and tell you all about that. Um, but we need to uh, do more. Not only do we need to worry about keeping these people in jail, but while they're in jail, we need to be worrying about giving them some services. You know, and if we're saying we don't have the money to do that, I, I don't know that I believe that because if we have $120,000 to buy vehicles that I'm not sure that we needed, um, then we had money to uh, invest in some programs. And, and where would you look for those programs? <clears throat> I've had, since uh, I've announced my candidacy, three different agencies, um, volunteers that said, we want to come back to the jail. We want to get back in there and we want to help, you know, um, do what we used to do. I've had people with the ministry um, reach out to me and say, we would like to meet with you. We're a volunteer, been volunteering here for years. Um, and we want to talk to you. We want to see, you know, what you have to offer and what you plan to bring to the table. You know, and I, and I even said um, at my campaign rally, I said, you know, I, I'm willing to give up. It's open record. You can find out how much money the jailer mm -hmm. makes. I'm willing to give up some of my first year salary to get these things accomplished that I want to get accomplished. You know, the training that we need, the inmate programs that we need. We need some, we need some maintenance done out there. You know, that building's got some age on it. It's 30 years old. Mr. Rogers said for two years he'd been fighting with the bo boiler <clears throat> and then finally waited till it became an emergency issue you know, when went to our county judge and said, it's an emergency. We got to get this taken care of. We, we can't wait until we have a meeting. But if you've been working on this every week for two years, you pass the emergency part. You pass the emergency part. But your question was, you know, what, what, what could I do? The booking clerks is a big thing to me. Um, you know, that that inmate escape could have been prevented. And, and my biggest issue with the inmate escape is not the error that was made and how that happened, but the error that was made afterwards. The policy and procedure was not um, followed. Mr. Rogers did not um, notify law enforcement. 
Kentucky State Police was contacted, the Frankfurt Police Department was contacted, um, and they said that they did not receive any notification from Mr. Rogers. And I don't know that Franklin County would have known had the State Journal not inquired about it. Which leads me to wonder, is this an area where people are as unaware as I am about some of the problems there? Or do you find the people from the public are coming to you with concerns that they have <clears throat> and they, they want to address them? Right, and, and that's what it is because they don't know. We, we don't talk about the jail. Nobody talks about the jail. Unfortunately, it's coming up more and more. You know, we still don't know if there's gonna be a price tag on the two inmates that were killed over the, the summer. You know, they were left, let out, you know, um, the, you know, they were let out, went to a work detail that day. They were released to someone that had not been trained on inmates, how to uh, supervise inmates. You know, and that's, I, I don't know where the price tag's gonna end on that with Franklin County. I don't, I, I, I don't know. I, do, I haven't followed that case. I'm sure it's open record and, and I'm sure it's still under investigation, so probably wouldn't find anything. And I'm going by, <clears throat> excuse me, what, um, what's in the paper and the, and the paperwork filed in the courts by the families of those two young men that were killed in that crash. You know, um, whether they were an inmate or not, you know, two people died. And I'm not saying that piece of paper, that that man being trained would have prevented that car wreck, but maybe they would have had a seat belt on. You know, they didn't even have a seat belt on. Well, I'm discovering there are a myriad of problems that, that I simply did not recognize. Uh, I'm sure that a lot of our viewers are doing that too. More important to, to all of this is a way to resolve these issues. And I guess my question to you is, what are the skills that you bring to this? What are the experiences <clears throat> that you bring to this that would give you the ability to put some improvements, some changes, some corrections into right. this situation? Um, again, I said I, I began working at uh, the jail in 1987. I actually worked when the jail was down in Catfish Alley. And a lot of people, when you say, you know, uh, at the old jail, and they were like, well, I, we didn't know there was an old jail. So in Catfish Alley, um, behind where the new courthouse is, I began working there in the office. I was 18 years old, out of high school, went to Western Hills High School, and we wanted to fast track, wanted to be a law enforcement officer. And I thought, I'm gonna go to work at the jail, and I'm gonna start in the office, and you know, as soon as I turn 21, I'll get over to the secured side of the jail. So I would gather all the information and the knowledge that I could find out about the jail, you know, from the front end of it to when I finally could get over there to the secured side of it. And um, more, the more I found out, the longer I worked there, I was like, I'm kind of liking this, you know, I, I'm enjoying this. And as soon as I got over on the other side, um, you know, I just hit the ground running. I was promoted by the time I was 23 years old. I was in charge of a $6.5 million facility, 200 inmates, and a staff of, you know, 20 people. And that was exciting for me. And I've, I've always, you know, enjoyed this leadership position. But I have the knowledge and to run that jail. And I had it when I was 23 years old. I took it very seriously. We had inmates like Clifford Gordon and Ronald Bays. These men are sitting on death row, and they were in housed in our jail. A, a small time that I worked at the Franklin County Regional Jail, I signed a contract and uh, began working for the United States Marshal's Office and transported inmates for the United States Marshal. Um, I do have a background. I have several hours of training for the Department of Corrections and the Department of Juvenile Justice. I have something to offer um, Franklin County and transparency training and inmate programs are my, is the platform that I'm running on. And I will not, will not hide things from the public. This is an opportunity for you to look into that camera right now and tell the viewers why you are the better candidate and why they should be casting a vote for you on May 22nd. Thank you. 
I'm Tracy Hopper. I'm running for jailer here in Franklin County. I have years of experience. I um, will be your best option. I will. I promise you transparency. I promise you that the training that needs to be taken care of and done will be done. I'm not going to uh, squander and waste your tax dollars. I'm not going to do that. I can afford to pay my own insurance and my gas money and for a vehicle to drive back and forth. Um, I would like for you to go to my website, Tracy Hopper for Jailer. I also have a Facebook page and a Twitter. All the information that I've given you will be being shared out there over the next 10 weeks until election time. Um, I'll be putting the budget out there. I'll be putting um, all of the incidents that I've spoken of. And I have a phone number out there as well. Give me a call. I answer my business phone um, when I'm not in the classroom. We really want to thank Tracy Hopper for coming in this afternoon and talking with us about this to give us a chance to get to know this candidate. So make sure that you stay alert for the Candidates Forum on April 26th down at the hotel. Participate if you can and stay alert by all means and come back and share with us the live coverage of the election returns on May the 22nd from the county clerk's office and to make sure that you're able to go into that voting booth and cast the vote, the vote that is the best for you, make sure you come back here and meet the candidates.